I'm Chris McDonough, a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Room, everybody, have we ha got a special guest for you, Dr. Kenneth Kinsey. He was the very memorable star witness who helped convict Alex Murdoch of a double murder in South Carolina. Dr. Kinsey comes to us not only as an expert in the use of force, but he's also the chief deputy of the Orangeburg County Sheriff's Office, where he also now is assisting in the independent investigation of the death of Stephen Smith. His full bio is going to be below, but let me give you just some high-level overview. He's not only an expert in bloodstain pattern analysis, but crime scene reconstruction and investigation, fabric compression examinations, fingerprinting, tire tread, footwear, the list goes on. He's also a professor who teaches in the at the university level. He's a chief investigator who has been involved in hundreds and hundreds of investigations involving death around not only in the South Carolina area, but as you saw in some very high profile cases, Murdoch just being one of them. He's an amazing human being a great man, as honest as they come, and we are honored to have him here tonight in the interview room. With that, welcome Dr. Kenneth Kinsey. Thank you, Chris. I'm extremely humble and happy to be here, and you can send me an invoice for that intro because that might be the best one yet. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, thank you so much. We're humbled to, uh, to have you here this evening. Man, you are going 100 miles an hour. We know that. You've been uh, brought in to take a look at the uh, Stephen Smith investigation as part of, uh, you know, what I think Nancy Grace called it the dream team. And uh, so that's exciting uh, to see you uh, participating in that with the other group. And, and we're going to get into that uh, a little bit here in the, uh, the next uh, – time that we have together. And, but before we do that, I think it's important for people uh, to get to know you a little bit more on a personal level in relationship to the Murdoch trial. Uh, as everybody knows, you know, Dr. Uh, Kinsey was brought in uh, as an expert and he gave a riveting account uh, about how Alex used two separate guns uh, during that particular trial or during that particular crime. And after the verdict, what I think was very unique, and I've been around this game for quite some time, that the jury actually asked him to come in personally, you know, at the, at the end of the verdict. And they thanked him for personally explaining uh, everything so well. I mean, wow. What, what a feeling that must have been. How, what was that like? Chris, uh, that, that's the first time in my career it's ever happened. I was shocked, and one of the courthouse security members came up to me, and I knew they had released the jury the day before. The judge had turned them loose, and, and man, I've got so much respect for that jury. 
They were there six weeks away from their families and their jobs. And the worker said, uh, Mr. Kinsey said, the jury wants to speak to you. I said, the jury's gone. The judge cut them loose yesterday. And they said, no, they're back. They wanted to watch the sentencing. So they led me into this little room. And I, I don't believe it was all 12 plus the other alternate, I think. But it was a room full. It was 10. It was at least 10. And they thanked me. I, I didn't know what they were going to say or why they were calling me in there. And when I went in, they thanked me and, and it choked me up for a minute. And I once I got my composure maintained and, and back. I thanked them. And, uh, you know, they got the hard part. My part was rather easy compared to what they have. And I like interpreting and giving information to the jury a lot better than I like making the decision. So I respect them. And even if it would have come out the other way, they would have still had my respect because that's the way our system works. And people that complain about it, I still say it's the best one we know of. Well, you know, you are, I think, such a... Uh, a force to be reckoned with. And I think we saw that very clearly uh, in the trial and your testimony. I mean, your expertise uh, that came to the table uh, was, you know, it's just top notch. I mean, it was just exactly what the jury needed to hear. It was honest. It was direct. It was, tr it was everything that made sense in, in relationship to what you were looking at. And you were you were brought into this prosecution team, uh, which was the other dream team, by the way, right? Uh, tell us yes, about sir. that was. Tell us what that was uh, like when you got that phone call. Wow, I was doing what you're enjoying now, Chris. Uh, we had spoken. I had spoken with uh, with uh, a dear friend of mine who's a captain in the region at Sled, and he said, "Will you give us a hand looking at a piece of evidence?" And I said, well, you know the answer to that before you even ask. But when you get to that point, let me know. And that was in July of 21. So, you know, a year and some months passed by and my family and I were in North Carolina, way in the mountain, no reception. Uh, we were coming back out of the mountains, pulling my pulling my camper and my messages started popping on my phone. I mean, it was one after the other, after the other, after the other. And I had a message on there from someone to uh, give Attorney General Creighton Waters a call. And I said, huh, I wonder what this is. So I called the sled agent first and he said, look, they're, they're ready to get you in here and they need your help. So I called him right then and it wasn't a question of if or maybe. He's like, you know, shoot me an email so I got all your information and we'll handle this. I can't do it today. We'll handle it tomorrow. And the next day, I think, was a Tuesday, and everything, the deal was sealed, you know, by Tuesday at lunchtime. So walk everybody through, um, I don't know if the public, you know, completely understands. I mean, immediately, you were, you had access at some point to the case file, and then uh, the theory on the defense side was two shooters. What? What walk everybody through how you dissected that case file and then how you put started putting the pieces together? Absolutely, Chris. Thank you. Uh, a lot of people, and, and this was the first time in my career that I had to do this because you know I'm used to our county grand jury, and that's that's a big deal. It's really a big deal. But the state grand jury is one step above that. And I mean the secrecy, the locked rooms, the uh, codes to get into the rooms. So, of course, they had to get permission from the state grand jury. And I actually have the court orders for me to even, you know, even look at the evidence. So it took a couple of days. After I said the deal was, uh, was sealed. It took a couple of days before they got that court order. But once I had that court order in front of me, then they gave me access to their digital Dropbox system, which was another big deal. I mean, it's almost like giving blood to uh, be able to get in there. And then we had our first meeting and we had our first meeting. You know, I, I'll preface it with this, Chris. I'm from the old school 
Uh, I was trained from the old school and, you know, a lot of pioneers before me who were my elders taught me, but I was listening. But I can't program an alarm clock. It, it terrible. I mean, I've learned this technology because of COVID. But three years ago, I couldn't have been having this conversation with you now. I'm, I'm, I'm old school. And we sat down and he said, we've got a terabyte of evidence. Well, I had no clue what he was talking about, but I knew it was a lot. So uh, we had a meeting and it's, it's, I was a little standoffish because there are people in this room that I, a couple I know, but it's people I've never seen before. And, and they were attorneys that had different specialties, you know, cell phone. Uh, one is real good at cell phone. One's good at tracing the money. Uh, one has done some violent crime. And it, it was one heck of a team. And then you've got these sled agents in here, too. You've got David Owen, who was the lead agent. And then, and then you've got Ryan Kelly, who did the footwork part for David Owen. And then you had several others that were in there for support purposes. And Creighton gave me the reins. And I, I worked three or four private cases a year. And I've always helped with some law enforcement cases. Looking towards retirement when I can up that up that a little bit, but you know, it, it, I still run an agency, so uh, it's not new to me. But it, this part was new. It's I, I didn't think I'd be back in the courtroom with a criminal case this soon, but I was hired to look at a piece of evidence, and it's out there. It's out there in my report because the defense attached it to a motion, and it was a shirt. It was a shirt. And the question was, does it have blood spatter on it or not? And they had uh, used a renowned expert who I have much, much respect for. And I couldn't I, I never said he was wrong. I just said I can't. And, and I laid out the reasons. I said, I can't agree with this. So I figured they would, you know, throw me a little check for the couple hours I worked and tell me to pound sand. Well, next thing you know, I'm wrapped up in it. And five months later, this is where we are. But Creighton told me uh, when I work for a private attorney, and, and you probably know this in the civil world, a lot of times you'll be retained. And once you come up with a opinion or once a result or you work it up, the lawyer has the choice. They can use you or not use you. They can pay you and tell you to go away. And that keeps the other side from retaining you. But in the criminal world, everything is discoverable. So in the conversation with Creighton Waters, and I didn't know him, uh, I knew who Mr. Wilson was, but I didn't know Creighton Waters. I said, how do you want me to report this? He said, I want you to be the canary in the coal mine. He said, if you see something wrong, I want it in on paper and I want to know and we'll deal with it. And I, and I like that from day one. I like it because I don't believe in in hiding things or and I don't believe in, in not addressing things and hoping the other side don't find it. I'd rather hit it head on. And they were they were the same issues. I've never worked a perfect crime scene. I've never worked a perfect investigation. I, I've made every mistake you can make except planting evidence, fabricating evidence and lying under oath. I mean, I'm the guy that's driven off with a box of evidence on the trunk of the car. I mean, it, it's happened. Uh, you just try not to make that mistake twice yeah. and you try to learn from it. So I had a terabyte. Yeah. I had a guy put a, uh, a, a big gulp from uh, 7-Eleven on top of a cab where I had a guy dead inside. So Yes, sir. I, I, have, I sneezed. Um, I sneezed on a box of evidence one time. I was... <laughs> Coming down with a cold and I sneezed on it. It was nowhere else to go. It, I went to the, the point of least resistance. It was a couple pieces and everything else was laid out on the counter. So, I mean, it happens, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah, I didn't but the it thing that, mm -hmm. no, no, you're great. The thing that impressed me was the integrity and the honesty in that team. And, you know, the other side of uh, the defense attorneys, I'm not familiar with two of them, but Mr. Jim Griffin and, of course, Dick Harpootlian, they are, I I've described them in a good way. They are great white sharks. They are apex predators. And if I was sitting where Mr. Murdoch's sitting, I would want that team sitting by my side. So it was, you know, we knew it was going to be a big deal. 
leading up to it. Uh, I addressed everything forensically that I thought needed to be addressed. Creighton Waters gave me the reins and said, run with it. And we did some briefings at night because those guys never, you know, they went home every couple weekends, but many weekends they were in Walterboro at the hotel and they, they were in a little war room there and I would come down at night and we would bounce things around. And Mr. Wilson was there the, almost the entire time. And it was kind of like, it was described as a dorm room environment, but it wasn't a lot of smiling. Everyone was really, really serious. And uh, to be honest, it, I haven't experienced that, you know, on the outside with different agencies in a long time. And it was kind of refreshing. Yeah, everybody had their game face on and they realized that this is the world was watching. I can only imagine what that uh, um, that sense was. Now, let, let's break that down for a second, because the shirt, I Sorry. think there's a, a lot of misinformation about Detective Owens. I mean, I, I thought I've always thought the guy did an amazing job. Uh, some folks have taken some shots at him uh, because of that shirt. Uh, break that down a little bit deeper so the public understands what exactly was going on with that shirt and what information and the, the timing of that uh, information that he had uh, about that shirt. Well, you know, uh, no dog, no dog poop, if that makes sense. And by all accounts, I, I Everyone I know that would look at that shirt would swear it's one thing. That's about as specific as I'm going to get on that because it's okay. been beat to death. But then when you get a, a test back, for whatever reason, whether the chemicals didn't work or the reagent was bad or the two didn't operate together, whatever reason, uh, it's just hard to get up there and put your credibility behind, even though you believe it behind something that science says may or may not be true. And he went, uh, Owens went, Owen went by what he, David went by what he knew. He went by the professional opinion that was given to him. And that's, that's what he went with. And if you look at that report, I did make, I did form an opinion on a stain on that shirt, but it's one I watched happen on body camera. And, you know, the courts have said over and over and over again, we can use our senses to draw a conclusion. And I watched that stain deposited on that shirt. But I still think it was the best decision to leave that shirt alone. I, it, it, was, it muddied the water just too, too much. And some of the other evidence was much stronger. So I, I didn't have a say so in what was or what wasn't. But I think it was a great a great decision by the attorney general's office. Yeah. And I think the public doesn't understand that if, when chemicals are used, it degrades, uh, the, you know, the, the substance that could have been on that shirt. And, and so that, that said, uh, what, what was it like when you were asked to demonstrate by a uh, waters about how Maggie was shot? Uh, he was, he was laying face down on the floor in your first testimony. Uh, tell us about that, how you, when you were demonstrating um, what your thought process was. Yes, sir. Well, we knew we had two fatal wounds. I mean, instant, instantly fatal. Damage to the, uh, the brain stem and, and, and another one in the head. We, we knew that the pathologist had said that's instantly terminal right then and uh then miss maggie had three other wounds and possibly four and the fourth one was to the wrist and that could have been a continuation of one of the other ones or it could have been with a little manipulation it would have fit as a continuation but it it lacked the uh stippling as with the other one in the midsection so they would uh the pathologist wouldn't call it i do not blame her for that it was uh, non-fatal wound, and I really didn't think we need to put a lot of time on it, and w we went with that. But the other ones, the one in the thigh and the one in the uh, abdomen, were both at almost the same angle. So we know those were probably in succession, and both of them had stippling. 
Uh, the ring was a little bit bigger on one, so it would make sense that the rifle was a little bit closer to one side than the other. And then we knew those three non-fatal wounds first. We knew that would cause a great amount of pain, and she would, at bare minimum, bend over. The only way I could make the angle work is with her being down in a crawling position, and it, and it worked perfectly uh, with the abrasion and the burn on her midsection and then the damage that it caused after that and, of course, where that bullet rested. Uh, Creighton, who is a, a little bit younger than me, but we're still north of a certain pinpoint age, uh, he said, I want you to demonstrate it on me, and he didn't, he didn't warn me. And he's dressed, you know, he's got a, a, a real sharp suit on. And once we started, I didn't think about it anymore. He said, now don't, he told me before we started, he said, don't go easy on me. If you need to manipulate something, manipulate it. If you notice, I grabbed his neck one time and I felt like I was Dr. Kinsey, the chiropractor, because I was able to twist his neck. But uh, he's a great guy. He, he wanted that. He was at the reins and I certainly was going to give him whatever he needed to get it across to the jury. Well, that was extremely uh, riveting. The, the world watched that moment. And it reminded me, you know, as you, as you know, I mean, I did my time in Southern California and I was there during the, you know, the, the, the uh, OJ problem. And Ooh, yeah. it, it was one of those moments where the world was just, you know, waiting to see, you know, if the glove fit or if it didn't fit. And you, you are, I mean, I was sitting at home going, holy cow, I can't, you know, and, and, and the, everything just fit. It just fit for the, for that particular moment. And then of course, you know, the, the evidence in of itself just spoke for it, for itself, but you were able to interpret that evidence so clearly and then explain it. Uh, to the public. And then, so now the defense gets an opportunity to bring their own expert in uh, and without going into details, you know, about that guy, but, you know, I can say it, it's my opinion. It's not yours. You got to be kidding me. Okay. So that's where I'll just leave that. But that said, you were brought back to, for a rebuttal witness uh, for the, for the prosecution to take the other stuff and and kind of fix it. What were some of the things that were that just wasn't making sense that he was trying to present uh, to the jury in your mind? Well, the the first thing, Chris, and you know, I I would like to add a little bit. There were four experts. Uh, you know, they had they had three very competent experts on their side. But four counting the one that I, I think you were talking about, and I'm not saying anything bad about him. I just don't think he qualified for what he for what he was there for. I mean, there's he's definitely effective in what he does. But the biggest hiccup overall was the the direction of the headshot on Paul. And you know, I didn't know Dr. Reamer, but she did a phenomenal job and. I agreed with what she said. I helped her figure out the angles on Miss Maggie and the ones on Paul were so apparent. And I had that demarcation line that I talked about with body fluid and, and blood on the material on that top shelf. I mean, and it's as clear as night and day. And then, you know, at the doorway, you've got that four inch void. So you know that it's under the doorway, but en enough outside that it doesn't uh, cover that first four inches. And to hear that that shot pellet, those shot pellets, you know, turned around and come back at 1,450 feet per second with enough force to lodge in the door frame. And, you know, I, I hunt. I hunt birds. That, that's what I do. I, quail hunting is my life during quail season. And, you know, we shoot dove and, and quail and rabbit, and we use a shotgun a lot. And my whole family, we enjoy the outdoors, and we hunt, and I'm a shotgun instructor. And uh, it, was, it was just a crazy notion. You know, yes, you may get some back spatter. I understand that. I've been trained in it. But not to the, the point that you're going to have pellet defects in a steel door, many of them. 
you know, he highlighted one and then they tried to snatch the picture back. And if you look at my testimony, I said, no, 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 spread it back out. Let's count them. And it, I got up to 11 before they uh, reduced the photo again on the screen. So I thought it was a crazy theory. Uh, and I found it hard to believe that the doctor in Charleston, Dr. Reamer, she got everything right. There was no complaint whatsoever out of all these witnesses except one fatal shot on Paul and one fatal shot on Maggie. Now, isn't that, you know, isn't that just a little bit suspicious? She did everything right, but she got those two backwards. And I really believe it. And I really felt confident in it. Uh, not to mention, I didn't think it was right for me to testify to the, uh, the medium that was in the shot shell on the shoulder shot. But I actually, I helped her identify the medium inside the, the shell. And uh, so that's, you know, just another point. She was fired up and she got to come back also. And uh, she hammered that party in. So it was it was tense. You can't let them see you sweat. But, you know, with my style, Chris, and, and I'm not saying it's right for everyone, but it's, it's worked for me. I am just nice. I'm just nice. If it's, you know, if they insult me, I'm I'm nice. It, because I got to win that jury over and I've got to explain to them to the best of my ability that evidence. And I'm going to do it. I can make mistakes, but I'm going to do what I think is right. And I'm going to explain it to them the right way. Now, that being said, you can do whatever you want to do, but it's hard to kick a person in the calf too many times if they're nice. Because I knew that these two apex predators, their style is to really get spun up and, and they're brutal. I mean, they are. I've been against Mr. Harpootlian a couple times and the most brutal was in 2000 in federal court. He, he can get spun up. And I was a lot more intimidated back then. But they can't eat you. They cannot eat you. So if you can weather the storm and just be nice. Nine out of 10 times, you're going to come out on top. Absolutely. Kill them with kindness. It drives them crazy. Especially yes, sir. In the, especially in the courtroom. Um, and if now, you notice, Chris, can I add? Can I add? Uh, please, please. Judge, Judge Newman is, you know, I, I've got awesome respect for him. It's not the first time I've been in Judge's courtroom, but it's the first time I was in his courtroom that long. And uh, if, if anyone notices, Every time a attorney would ask me to step off the stand, I would look at him and ask permission. And, you know, he, he was like, go, no, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, he was really, really cool. But that's just that's just the respect in the courtroom. And uh, you've got to pay that respect to those. They call him judge. I call him referee. Now, I'm going to call him your honor when I'm talking with him, but I call him the referee. But those 12 men and women in that jury box, that's the judges. So I always look at it like that. And, you know, if you're a, if you're a fighter or a boxer and you're in that ring, you're always going to respect that referee. I always respect the referee. And sometimes if if they're teetering on an objection, sometimes it'll work to your advantage if, if that judge really likes you. So I always try to uh, win over the judge with honesty. And I always try to win over the jury with honesty. Absolutely. And you said something interesting. Uh, I don't think the public knew there were three other reports or three other experts that took a look at this. And I'm assuming, and this is just going to be a guess real fast and keep me honest here. What, what were the, uh, what were the other three, uh, opinions? There was a, there was a pathologist from another state who had a, you know, wonderful credentials. They had a, uh, a gentleman from, Connecticut that he's very credentialed also and very respected in the forensic world. Then they had another gentleman from up north that ran a laboratory. But when he come in, he was really hitting sled hard with the policies and, you know, the booties and the scene protection and that kind of thing. But I don't think he was provided with all of the information. And as it came to light on the stand, he shifted. He, he, he buckled. He went from, you know, tarnishing sled. By the time he got off the stand, he was complimenting the agents that actually worked the scene. 
So that that kind of backfired, and and I truly believe the uh, gentleman that locked it in to five foot two and said it was no way possible for anybody of any other height to fire that weapon. Uh, I don't believe the jury ever paid any attention to that. Uh, the other two were a little bit, you know, a little bit more credentialed, and and you've got to show them some respect. So, you know, it's it's who it's who interprets it best and who gives it to the jury in a way that they can understand it. And I'm so simple minded, Chris, that I wasn't putting on an act for the jury. That's the way I learn. And so that's also the way I teach. Absolutely. I mean, and that humility of I, I had a uh, I had an opportunity to meet a guy named Jigsaw John. He was with LAPD uh, homicide for 44 years. And I sat with him at a, it was what we call the Chia conferences, you know, California Homicide Investigators Association. And I had a chance to sit down with him and I said, hey, Jigsaw, can I ask you a question? He says, absolutely. I said, um, what's your secret? You know what, it, you know what his, his response was? He goes, are you teachable? <laughs> I mean, I'm like putting my fruit at this guy's feet, right? And the only thing he wants to know is if I ask that question, can he can he mold me? Can he can he will will I take in what he says and not pretend that I know it all? And you know, I had a very successful career as a result of just that counsel. And you're that same kind of guy. You present very very uh, succinctly uh, to the public. So you get up on the, the stand a second time. Now you've got Wilson about how Alex shoots Paul. Walk us through that. Well, you know, that was a little intimidating. I had gotten to know uh, General Wilson the last couple of weeks from those nighttime briefings. Chris, we're talking, now it's not California, it's South Carolina, but we're talking about the top attorney in the state. And, you know, he, he does smile and laugh and joke, but he's got a public persona also. So it's really, really serious the first time we had a briefing, and it's really, really serious the second time. And I said, well, the third time he's going to relax a little bit and ease up. Well, no, he's really, really serious the third time, too. And he said, I may, uh, you know, I may uh, examine you on the stand. And I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm waiting for Creighton to uh, tell me. And I said, well, you're Creighton's boss. He said, not, not this six weeks. So uh, we got our heads together and he said, look, I want you to point the, the weapon at me. The, we were locked up because the door swung the same direction as the feed room door. And the only difference was the threshold was about two foot thick where it was four inches thick, you know, at the original scene. And they had beat it so much, you know, going the opposite direction. They even they even fired into a ballistic dummy on the sidewalk at the at the original scene. So now you know what you have on the sidewalk for sure now. And we didn't fold, you know, even when they brought that stuff in. And uh, Mr. Wilson was, you know, rapid fire. He had great, he, he was methodical. He had everything planned out. And it was one question after another question after another question. And I told him. I said, look, if you get hung up, not that the attorney general will get hung up, but we all get hung up in front of a crowd of people. If you get hung up and you lose your, your thought, I said, throw the question out there. I will pause. If they object, then the judge is going to, you know, do one of two things. I said, then he's going to say, rephrase the question. I said, you rephrase it and let me go. I said, we got this. And uh, we, we, he said, well, how about, the, he said, we could do the demonstration at the end. And I had a rubber gun, you know, one used in training. And I'd been carrying it around up there for about a week in a gun box. And he said, I think I want to use the real, the real gun. And I said, whatever, you know, let your clutch out. And he said, I want you to point it at me. I said, no, sir, you're taller than me by almost two inches. I said, you need to point it at me. So we did it. Uh, my friend, uh, Dan Gregory who was the uh, security officer behind us. He's a retired federal guy. And Mr. Wilson asked him, can you get us access to that room? And do you think the judge will let us use the room? He said, I get you access anywhere in this courthouse. And I believe he will. 
So it was, you know, he asked for permission ahead of time and uh, slightly ahead of time because I don't think he wanted it to get out. We were about to do that. And we worked it. And it, it was, I, I'm telling you, it was my favorite moment. Well, probably my favorite moment is when Mr. Harpootlian tried to get down. And, and I was really scared. I, I tried to catch him. I even offered to get down there for him because uh, I didn't want him to hurt himself in that doorway. But uh, it, it was the highlight. It, it absolutely, I, I thought I was chilling, Chris. I was just chilling. I mean, my job was easy. And when I say that, you know, I'm not being really, really sincere because I had some rough late nights, but these guys lived this case. They lived it, feet on the ground every day. And once I got done the first time, and I'll be honest, I've never had that kind of reception from the public, from the news media. You know, I was I was probably kind of enjoying it a little bit in a humble way. I, I wasn't doing any interviews because the court wasn't over yet. But I was just, I said, I'm going to sit back for the next week, week and a half, and I'm going to watch this trial. I'm going to really just dig into it. I'm going to take notes, and I'm just going to sit back here, and they'll forget about me. And then Creighton come to me and said, oh, we got to put you back up. And I was like, wow. You know, I said, okay, whatever it takes. I said, whatever it takes, put me back up, and, and we'll do it. And, uh, you know, I was already, when, when they were hitting David, so hard, and I'm, I'm going to say it because uh, it was put out in court. David Owen's mother passed away that Tuesday, and uh, that Wednesday, they're hammering him on the stand, and they knew it. This whole court knew it. They set it out of camera, and it, it just infuriated me, and I, I told Creighton, put me up there, but, you know, they couldn't then because they had already started the direct, but I, I, I'm paid to do this, man. Put me up there because I can, I can take this. And uh, David made it through, and, and he, he's a better man for it. And uh, he got through that rough spot in his life. But, uh, you know, th that's probably the only time I really got angry. But I really thought that I had a week and a half of smooth sailing uh, sitting on the back row. But it didn't end up that way. But I'm thankful. Uh, I'm thankful to the Lord above that it, it didn't because I really feel like we were effective in that second presentation. Yeah, no, you hit a home run, and the backstory, obviously, with all the other situations going on, the emotional responses going on, you know, but David is a perfect example, and then, of course, the judge had lost his son, you know, just before yes, sir. a lot of this, so, yeah, there there were a lot of moving parts. You know, I, I have to, you know, one of the things when the first body officer got on the scene, uh, and you see his body camera when he gets out. You, if you look straight down, do you remember where you see where Alec was standing on that very, when the first, first officer got on the scene, he's, he's up against the side where the kennel is and he's straight down. And when you testified, if you were to take that, the, the trajectory of where those rounds were coming from, that's the area he stepped out of yes, from, sir. from the very first officer on the scene. Did that, did you have any thought process about that when you first saw it? Well, it was so disorganized, Chris. Uh, you could probably get one of those angles from the 300 from standing anywhere in the vicinity. And that's why it was so ludicrous that Miss Maggie had, you know, four injuries and maybe five if it wasn't a continuation where well, you've got seven or eight uh, defects from bullets. And now, the one let, that we talk. Let's break that down real fast for the, for the public that doesn't understand that. Explain, you're talking about a through and through wound when you say a continuation. Yes, sir. Yeah, she's, she's got uh, the one on the wrist could have been through and through in the direction it traveled from uh, bottom to top. Her wrist would have matched up in between there, or it could have been a separate wound. So if it was, it was five shots, you know, five injuries, or four, and there's really no way to tell it because, like I mentioned earlier, that lack of stippling. But there was at least seven cartridge cases located, and uh, the the one bullet defect that we concentrated the most on, and I thought it was crazy, and and that's where I, I think I had to, you know. When I asked him, really, you know, uh, we kept hitting this 
one bullet defect in cardboard, in weathered cardboard that had been outside for almost two years we know of. And one of the experts is is harping on this angle in this cardboard. And it it was such a waste of time. I, I really think it was a epic failure on their behalf. They should have concentrated on one of the other ones, in my humble opinion. But uh I really think that was really just slowing down the process and and, and wasting the uh wasting the jury's attention myself. But uh the imp- we know it we know they were moving. We know that the shooter was moving and now we know it was Alec. We know Miss Maggie was moving. You know, that's that's the only thing we know for sure, because there was so much foot activity in that little area. And we know she was close to that four wheeler, the side by side, because I, I found the, the blood and, and body fluids on that side by side in the photos when I started examining the photos. And then the uh, one expert that was going to testify that it was a footwear impression on her calf. Creighton actually asked him. You know, after I had identified it as as a tire tread, Creighton asked him, he said, didn't you prepare another PowerPoint? He said, yeah, well, why aren't you showing that one to the court? And uh, he said, well, they told me not to use that one. Well, I mean, it, it really would have been bad for, I guess, for his career and his credibility had he used that. But uh, I'm glad he didn't. He he did the right thing. And uh, it was all about it was all about stirring, you know, stirring the pot, Chris, uh, throw something on the wall and hope something sticks. But we were relentless and, and stuck behind our, our theories and, and the electronic data and evidence was just incredible. Yeah, no, it you 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 are. I can't I can't compliment you enough because your testimony was so direct and truthful. I mean, even even when you thought there was something that and it's the best answer in the world with the one of yeah that that's possible right i yes, mean that, that's the best answer any homicide guy homicide 101 you could ever give a defense attorney is they take you down the lane of you know yes 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 and then they get they hit you with well is that possible well yes of course anything's possible and you you just led it, it just kept going on the only th- I think they made a huge mistake by introducing the height of of the shooter, five foot. Yes, sir. What what say you? <laughs> Absolutely, and that's what I said. You know, they asked me if I could tell the height of the shooter, and I'm like, well, here I'm five two, and then I stepped up. It was eight inches on that step in the witness box. I had measured it, and I stepped up. I said, now I'm six six. And then I stepped up again. I said, now I'm 7'4". I can still make that same angle. And I thought that was pretty effective also. You know, Kenny Kinsey's testimony didn't prove guilt. My job, I neutralized, you know, some information that come from other experts. And, and you know, when you sit back and look at the big picture, that's it. I mean, I'd love to say I, I saved the day and, you know, I, I really wouldn't. That's not what I say. but. I didn't save the day. Uh, some of those other character witnesses and, and close members, you know, almost family members that testified to what they testified to. And then Paul testifying from the grave with that video. That's what saved the day. But my job now, I know my job was to neutralize those other experts because it was an unlimited pot of money. And you brought in some guys that had very good credentials. and. Just sticking to the truth, like you said, not being scared to say no or I don't know, or that's possible. And, you know, that's the most honest answer. Yeah, we used to call it the internal workings of a clock. Uh, You know, all the gears in sync with each other, every team member, every, every expert is part of that, those gears that are moving in different directions. And then you get, you figure out what time it is. That's, that's what, right. That's right. That's what, we, that's what we used to say in, in, uh, uh, our old unit. We, the other saying we had is, you know, this one, our day begins when your day ends. So, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so let's jump in. Uh, but you're part of, uh, the, the team that's been assembled is, can we talk about Stephen Smith without 
you know, obviously jeopardizing everything, anything. Are you, are you good with that? Yes, sir. I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable talking about anything that's been out there so far. Okay. So I want to show you a couple of pictures and then just kind of leave it up to you to tell us, uh, what, what's going on here. Well, you, you see some, some fluid activity on those pants and I'm probably not going to interpret it any further than that. That's Steven's pants, uh, or a photograph that I has, has, I've been told is Steven's pants. I haven't exact, exactly uh, examined the actual clothing, but uh, those are from the scenes, and I think those were put out with a FOIA. And the part that you know is is a little bit suspect to me about that clothing is the the lack of defects in it. They're not torn. They're not you know burnt up from the pavement. Uh, and, and like I said, I'm not going to get into the the fluids on on the clothing, but. Uh, Yep. That's what that is. That's his short pants. And, and then this, you've got his, his shirt, his shirt. And you can see uh, one side is lighter than the other one. And of course, that uh, that fluid activity it is more prone to one side than the other. The shoes, uh, as was you know put out public, he, he had his shoes on at the time. So that's a little bit odd for an impact act accident not always you know an absolute but it's a little bit odd to be honest yeah i mean i've seen you and i have both seen a ton of accidents where uh, if somebody is hit the just the velocity of the speed of the vehicle uh would potentially launch uh those shoes and in, in variety of directions now like you said not every time i mean there's there's always the possibility that the shoes could have maintained themselves on the victim, but highly improbable, I mean, versus probability. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, so you have to look at that exchange of energy, you know, and, and we get used to looking at Evil Knievel clips and see him going down the uh, tarmac. But uh, like you said, there are instances where that doesn't happen, and it just depends on where that energy is and, and what it's concentrated on when, when it transfers. See, now you're an OG. You're you're using evil Knievel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Don't let the youthful appearance fool you. <laughs> you are old school. I love you. That's perfect. Yes, sir. Uh, well, and and this, I mean, that pretty much is pretty in interesting uh, to me. I I and this is my opinion. It appears to be sand uh, now, and of course, the lab will figure that out. You don't have to comment on this one. We'll we'll let the um, your investigation as you guys get into the investigation here. But uh, I thought that was unusual. And then of course, this unknown substance, I think it's going to be interesting to find out. And this can be anything uh, just for clarity for everybody. I mean, would you agree with that? Oh, yes, sir. And, and I will tell you, you have a number of different soils in that area. It's an agriculture area. And, uh, you know, depending on Stephen's mode to get from, one scene to the other, you know, there's several different agriculture options between those two, but you know, that I agree with you there, you know, something that's going to have to be analyzed. Now, have you ever, uh, uh, Kenny, have you ever been, uh, where you guys brought in a botanist, uh, to a certain geographic region, let's say on a body dump. I, I, I'll tell you, we had a caper. I had a caper years ago where we took the air filter uh, from a guy's car. Uh, he said he was nowhere near where the body was discovered. And we sent all of the, we sent the air filter to a botanist who pulled the pollen out of the, the air filter and then went back to the scene. Have you know, do you know of other cases that you've been involved in or, or experienced that? I have been involved in cases where we use entomologists and, uh, Let's see, not agronomist, uh, those two, and of course, uh, anthropologists many times, but uh, agronomists and entomologists, I don't know that I have ever been a part of a case with a botanist. I'm not going to rule it out, but I just don't remember it if it was. Well, we went to, and you can go to probably University of South Carolina or whatever your alma mater is and see if they have a department there and see if you could get some interest 
our sled at least you know suggest it to the to the guys in uh, at sled up there uh, to see if there's any interest in in something like that because it was a it was a very powerful piece of evidence uh, and uh, you know there's no getting around you know the same type of you know stuff and I I also had a caper where they we had palm trees and the there were trees at a certain place and there there were two buckets uh that the suspect had stolen at this guy's house and we matched the the trees wow wow how about that wow that, that's that's pretty effective yes sir well, it's thinking out of the box right and here so what what can you tell us about um Stevens caper here what uh, i mean god bless you you know i know you're 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 knee deep into it but without jeopardizing anything sleds doing and of course what you guys are doing help us understand well i would tell you how about if i tell you what i've physically done chris i think that would be the uh probably the most important thing you know without uh if you come behind me and work a scene i'm not going to take it as an insult as a matter of fact i'm a consider it a technical review. And so what I did, I took all the available reports from the different agencies and I went back and I spent a day at the scene. And it, you know, somebody said, well, you remeasured everything. Yes, I remeasured everything. I found the GPS uh, on the power poles from the power company and I did it the old fashioned way with a tape measure. Now I did verify with Google Earth and, and some digital uh, satellite imagery. And then I walked. I walked it one way, one possibility. Then I walked it another way. I wanted to see what the possibilities were, every possibility, whether he was picked up, whether he went through the woods, whether he went up and took a dirt road around, or whether he walked the paved road, which was the, really the path of least resistance, but probably the one that made him the most vulnerable. Which way did he go? And uh, I spent a day down and I'm still, you know, putting my data together. But, you know, some of my colleagues that I work with now, they're like, man, you wasted your time remeasuring that. And, and re no, I, I don't think it was a waste of time. I wanted to figure out and I wanted to verify everything. It's not any insult to the original mate team members or the original deputies down there. I can't testify to it if I'm ever in a position to testify if I haven't verified it. And I felt that was very, very important and uh, went down there and did that and reworked everything that I could eight years later. I found features in the uh, landscape that were constant and I documented them and I found features that had changed a lot in eight years. And I use that in, in order to triangulate and, and locate some of the, the stuff there. So some of the items of evidence or where the items of evidence were originally. and. I think it was very, very effective. I've also been in communication with Dr. Dupree, who is a phenomenal, phenomenal pathologist. Phenomenal. And I didn't know it. World renowned. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I didn't know it because they were using a, another photograph on TV. And when I seen the one the other night, she went, she was on a show with me and her feed went down. And they thought, I said, I know her. So as soon as the show was over, I'm on the phone with her because. I've only been on a week, you know, officially I signed on Friday. Today is a week. So I hadn't had a chance to get with her. I uh, opted out of the actually attending the second autopsy. I was given the option, but I felt like my uh, efforts were better concentrated in Hampton because they had, you know, very competent pathologists and anthropologists. So they know what they're doing and they no doubt do great documentation. So uh, I, I one of my efforts to go somewhere else. But Dr. Dupree and I now have been, you know, conversing on the phone. And uh, I told her I was going to go down and look for some specific leads that I can't mention. And, and she said, well, you need me to ride along. You want me to help? I mean, she is, she's phenomenal. And uh, I asked her, I said, did I attend autopsies with you at MUSC or Newberry? She said, yes. So now I know we've kicked up some of the same you know, some of the same sand and uh, I've got a lot of faith in her abilities. So we're we're going to be OK. And I feel really, really excited that just the opportunity to try and get the Smith family some answers. Really, really excited. 
Yeah, no doubt. I think, um, you know, as, as the universe is on schedule, as I say, and it's time that whatever the truth is, the truth is the truth. And it, it's a constant, uh, as you know, you know, God always leaves a witness and that that could be human or that could be nature. Uh, either one will speak volumes. And I think your testimony going back to the Murdoch trial was a perfect example of, you know, the fact, the, the horrific scene there and the fact that his, you know, matter was going up. And it hit that door. And when you when you testified to that, and then you looked at the photographs, it was a very obvious situation that uh, you know that was the truth. And this is going to be one of those situations where there's enough smart people in the room to assemble the clock, and you guys will figure out what time it is. There's no question in my mind. And, and the other great thing is uh, all the egos are checked at the door uh, when you come in uh, to those war rooms to have that discussion. So, you know, God bless you. So, Kenny, I am going to give you the last word unless there's something I haven't. I'm going to give you the old, you know, interview technique. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you feel is important? <laughs> Uh, no, sir. I, I, I don't have the email address for tips. And I was going to utilize my time at the end to uh, give the phone number. I have the phone number, but I do not have the email address for SLED, okay. the one for the tip line. I, I would love to put that out, or if you can put that out later, I would be great. But I'll give the, I'll give the phone number, and uh, I just appreciate you, sir, and I appreciate the uh, faith in our abilities, and I'm, I'm glad to be with the smart folks in the room. I, I'm glad to be with them. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate your time this evening. Tell your family, thank you so much for uh, uh, sharing you uh, with uh, the interview room here. And uh, so hang on. Okay, you get the last word. Go. Hey, everyone. Thank you for letting me come in and, and share my experience with you. I just want to say that it's not the natural progression for a parent to bury their son or their child. Let's get Miss Smith and the Smith family some answers. Please, please, if you know anyone or if you have a tip, dial area code 803-737-9000. Area code 803-737-9000. Or submit your tips via email to tips at sled.sc.gov. Tips at sled.sc.gov. God bless you. And please stay safe. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Hard working every day. I'm stressed out. 24-7, babe. No, no timeouts. Wish we could fly away. You and I go to our favorite place. Oh, yeah, yeah. Make special memories together. I'll be your company now and forever. I say we fly away. You and me go to our favorite place. Feeling the sun on my face in Hawaii. With you, with you. With you, with you, Hawaii With you, with you, Hawaii I need a summer breeze Some fresh air To put my mind at ease I know no cares You wanna come with me Me and you Go to our favorite tree are you ready now? We jump on a plane now We're taking away Yeah, we're taking away Don't hesitate now We're taking away Yeah, we're taking away We'll never calm down We're going away Yeah, we're going away You and me Feeling the sun on my face in a while